Hi, this is Kyle Campbell, and I'm the preacher for the Loop 287 Church of Christ, and I'd like to welcome you to the Diakonos Virtual Bible Summit. A lot of us probably have felt that the reactions to COVID-19 in the last couple of years have been pretty severe, and while we hold our breath as to what the future is going to hold with mask mandates and vaccine mandates, we sure do hope that the worst is behind us. But that doesn't mean that everything that's gone on in the last two years have gone on without consequence. A lot of brethren have seen their congregations become pretty much battlefields for lots of different opinions about live streaming versus in-person services, about wearing masks, about getting vaccines, and all of these have become actually pretty difficult questions. And so this is why I think this particular subject is one that's really, really needed. And that is essentially the subject of fellowship. I'll be the first one to say that maybe the discussion feels a little bit dated halfway through 2022. But I don't think that it is. And here's why. Because the issues that we've just dealt with over the last couple of years... The idea, the attitude is going to come again. Now, how do I know this? Well, it's because at my age, I've lived long enough to see brethren actually discuss issues of whether or not women should wear head coverings in the assembly, of whether men who wait on the public communion table should have facial hair or should they have casual clothing. I've seen brethren disagree over whether men should be engaged in armed forces or in law enforcement service. So I know that these kinds of issues are always in front of us. And this latest opportunity with COVID-19 is going to come again in some kind of form. Now, because of all of this, the subject is indeed necessary. And so what we're going to do is first begin by looking at what fellowship is and how fellowship is actually accomplished. And then what we'll do is we'll look at our fellowship with one another, and then we'll make a determination of what actually is faith and opinion. And then finally what we're going to do is look at what churches do when they do have legitimate concerns about fellowship. Now let's first talk about the definition of fellowship. Essentially, whatever word is used or however it's used in the English language, the word in the original language basically means a participation or a sharing or an association that we have with one another. And actually, the word does occur a lot of times in the New Testament, but I wanted to give you just three examples because these three examples, while translated differently in the English, same word in the original language, but they can tell you or they show you kind of the different areas or the different avenues that the translators used to express this idea. The first one is in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. That reads, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So simply put, there the words just translated fellowship. But let's look a little bit further. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So there the concept of fellowship is expressed as shared. Now one more place, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 33. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. There the word is companion. So a fellowship, a sharing, a companionship, a participation, this is the idea of fellowship. Second, how is fellowship actually accomplished? When we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, we learn very quickly that mankind sinned. When they sinned, that made a separation between man and God. So God then set out, ultimately through His Son, Jesus Christ, to provide a way for man to be reconciled back to Him. So God actually sets the parameters of fellowship. 
Now that shouldn't surprise anyone because in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the New Testament is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So as I move from darkness to light, as I take hold of God's grace, I become one of His children. As I become one of His children, then I'm freed from my sins, and I also now have the opportunity, as John says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7, through 7, to walk in the light. Now, walking in the light means that it's got to be something that I do for the rest of my life. I have to, just like John encouraged in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, to be faithful unto death. If I am faithful unto death, I continue in my fellowship with God. I have a participation and a sharing with Him in these spiritual matters. Now third, when someone becomes a child of God, they not only enter into a relationship with God, but they also enter into a relationship with other Christians. So as long as I am walking in the light, and as long as you are walking in the light, we have something to participate in. We have something to share in. And that's exactly the way that God wanted it. And I participate and I share in my relationship with God through the local church. And that's very, very important because we can't just be Christians that kind of float around everywhere. God intended for us to serve Him through a local church. Now, Paul actually showed us this in Acts chapter 9 and verses 27 and 28. When he came from Damascus down to Jerusalem, he wanted to join with the disciples. Now, they didn't want him to, but Barnabas came to his aid and vouched for him, and they did indeed accept him. And when they did, he joined with them in a participation, in a sharing, and they were then able to to go out and preach the gospel and proclaim the gospel together. When you look in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47, as the church was founded on the day of Pentecost, these people engaged in activities that demonstrated their fellowship. And then as I walk in the light, my fellowship with you and my fellowship with the Christians here where I worship is going to depend on a few aspects. Number one, it's going to depend on my walking worthy of my calling in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Secondly, it's going to depend on me walking in love with one another in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It's going to depend on me caring for someone else's interest other than my own in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. And then finally, it's going to depend on me doing everything without murmuring or disputing in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Unity can be maintained in a local congregation even when members differ about certain things, including masks and vaccines. And I want to show you how. Paul wrote in two places, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and Romans chapter 14, where people can have differing convictions with one another and yet still be in fellowship. And this is where we come to the part of the video where we need to investigate the difference between faith and opinion. Third, the difference between faith and opinion. How can we maintain fellowship when we differ with one another, when we differ about masks and when we differ about vaccines? It is the difference between faith and an opinion. Faith in the New Testament speaks of a body of truth, a codified, revealed body of truth that cannot be altered and it cannot be changed. Every single child of God has the responsibility to follow it. Now this is expressed in a lot of different ways. You may see the word used faith or gospel or doctrine or teaching, but it all basically means the exact same thing. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. What were they obedient to? They were obedient to the gospel, that body of truth 
that cannot be altered and that cannot be changed. A little bit later in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 in the 5th verse, Paul wrote, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So see whether or not you are in the faith. See whether or not you are following that objective source of truth. Now this objective source of truth is an objective source that is knowable, it's identifiable, and it is teachable. In John chapter 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This is the truth, doctrine, teaching, instruction, faith, that we all have to agree on and that we all absolutely must hold to without exception. 2 John verse 9 says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So the doctrine of Christ, and the doctrine of Christ is going to teach us something very important that we'll come back to in just a moment. What it teaches us is that we can have different opinions in certain circumstances and we can accept each other. Now that's part of the doctrine of Christ and that leads us to a consideration of opinion. Opinion is an impression that rests on principles that we take from the New Testament, but yet there is no actual statement by God on the matter. I may have an opinion on this issue or on that issue. I may take in some of my ideas about the New Testament, but God hasn't actually spoken on it. God hasn't actually legislated on it. So because of this, as I follow it, and as I live by it in my own mind, yes, I'm living by something that's an opinion, but that's not something that I can bind on someone else. An opinion may very well be a very strong impression, and I may have had it most of my adult life, but it's just a deduction that I'm making from the scriptures that I've applied to my life that I now live by. I've got to say something that's difficult. And that is that opinions or personal consciences in some matters, these areas where God hasn't spoken or where God hasn't legislated, are almost always a hindrance to the work of God. They're almost never a help. I have seen so many churches that divide and that have so much difficulty because brethren have these different opinions and these different points of view that while they may have some nebulous connection with truth, they aren't actually the revealed Word of God. And so what they do is they create so much strife and so much discord, so much heartache, so much division within a congregation that they end up, while we feel very strongly about them, they end up destroying the work of God. Alexander Campbell called opinions persuasions without proof, and I think that's probably just about the best way that I've ever heard to define them. Now, one person's opinion may be right or it may be wrong, but the key is it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter to God. I mentioned two passages earlier, Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In both of these sections of Scripture, what Paul is doing is explaining that there are people who have various opinions on these matters. And these matters in these two chapters were more closely linked to the Judaism of past. For example, in Romans chapter 14, the major point was that they were discussing the eating of meats. They were discussing the keeping of days. And Paul, in a, the allowance of these issues that we have, said in Romans chapter 14 and verse 1, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not to have quarrels over opinions. A few verses later in Romans chapter 14 and verse 5, it says one person esteems one day above another, 
another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. And then finally in Romans chapter 14 in the 14th verse, Paul wrote, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Think about this just for a moment. If these instructions were given to divine truth, then that would erase everything that we know about divine truth. Paul is not saying that you just need to decide whatever it is that you want to believe about it. Paul is only reserving these instructions to matters that are opinion, persuasions without proof. In Romans chapter 14, the eating of meats or the eating of non-meats was something that was left to someone's own personal conscience. Fellowship is only possible when we have an unwavering commitment to revealed divine truth. And every Christian within a local body has to have that same commitment to truth. Now, as it happens, when they don't, then yes, other brethren have to be long-suffering. They have to make sure that they're teaching someone. They have to make sure that they're pulling someone closer to God and closer to truth. When no agreement on truth can be reached, a local congregation has no option except to withdraw their fellowship. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and Romans chapter 14 were explicitly written to say that in these matters of personal conscience or in these matters of personal opinion where God didn't legislate or where God did not spell it out, like situations revolving around the wearing of masks and revolving around the taking of a vaccine, a church is not to splinter over these issues. Finally, let's talk about the topic of when we should keep away. Church discipline is taught throughout the New Testament, but it's a topic that is difficult at best, and it's often misunderstood at worst. And so what we need to do is get a clear idea of what actually God wants us to do when fellowship is broken. Now I want to quickly add that no one craves the exercise of discipline. No one likes that. No one wants that. But we understand that in some circumstances it has to be done. But there's also another point that needs to be added. And that is a local body of Christians. You know, a lot of times we use the terminology of family and the New Testament definitely uses the terminology of family. And it needs to be a family. We need to be close. Because in order for disfellowshipping or withdrawing or keeping away or marking, no matter what you call it, in order for it to work, there needs to be this close personal relationship that exists among all of the members. And just kind of as another little side note, the issues that we've talked about previously, the idea of pushing these personal scruples, these personal conscientious objections that we have to different issues, again, where God's never legislated, does nothing but pull people apart. That's why I said that having a lot of these opinions does a church, most times, no good whatsoever. We need to be building each other up, and as we build one another up, we maintain this closeness. People maintain a fidelity to truth, and then when they don't, they feel that pull of the withdrawing of fellowship. Paul had a lot to say about discipline in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 1 through 13. And that's going to be our main text for the next few minutes. But this teaching is also replicated in Romans chapter 16. And there it's mainly dealing with a doctrinal issue, but it really doesn't matter. Disfellowshipping is disfellowshipping no matter what the issue. And it's also brought up in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. First, there's the need for discipline. And this is in verses 1 and the first part of verse 2. And that reads, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up 
and have not rather mourned. This is presumably an illicit sexual relationship that a man is having with his stepmother. What Paul specifically mentioned here is that not only was the sin very open, but that the Corinthians were, instead of being sorry for it, instead of mourning it, instead of actually trying to correct the situation, they had become arrogant and puffed up. Because of this, the testimony of the Corinthians has been severely hindered. Paul actually uses other terminology in other places, such as unruly, and that just basically means someone who falls out of line, someone who has a standard of the New Testament, but they're not following it any, anymore. They are unruly. They are out of step. God takes the purity of His church very, very seriously. He wants His church to be without spot and without blemish. And that means His children are going to have to walk according to His instructions in the New Testament. And when they don't, and they refuse to repent, then the church has to take action. Second, let's look at the method of discipline. Now this is going to be from the second half of verse 2 to verse 5. And it reads, That he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul, knowing the will of God, had already passed judgment in his inner spirit. He knew what needed to be done with this person. And now he's going to communicate that to the Corinthians. In Matthew chapter 18, the Lord is always going to bless what we righteously do in His name. So as Paul is giving these instructions to the Corinthians, he knows that if they will faithfully follow it, the Lord is going to bless them, even though this task is not going to be pleasant. Deliver is a very strong term, and essentially it indicates a judicial handing over of a sentence. So deliver to Satan is just a figurative expression to indicate that this person has been given over to the control of Satan. They are following what Satan wants them to do. So when you deliver them over to Satan, you are acknowledging that this is the way that they have determined to live their life according to their father, the devil. Third is the reason for discipline. This is verses 6 through 8, and they read, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Withdrawal protects the church. Again, God wants His church to be pure. He wants His church to be holy. And the withdrawing of fellowship, the acknowledging that someone is not following the precepts of God and are following the precepts of Satan is absolutely necessary for the purity of the church. The leaven of wickedness will slowly but surely bring spiritual death to any group or any congregation of the Lord's people. And this was why it was so important for the Corinthians to take action. Paul concluded by urging them to keep the feast. Now this feast, again, was a figurative expression that was indicative of the Passover feast. The Passover feast was kept with unleavened bread. So figuratively, that's in indicating to them that you need to keep this holy consecration of life you need to make absolutely sure that you're living your life not like this person is with sexual immorality, but making sure that you're living it with the leaven of righteousness and truth and peace. Fourth, there's the sphere of discipline. Now this will take us through the end of the chapter, verses 9 through 13. And they read, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, 
Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reveler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Several expressions are used to indicate what we are to do with this person. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says that we are to not have company with them. Romans chapter 16 says that we are to avoid them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, again, we are to not have company with them. And then in Titus chapter 3, we are to reject them. These expressions mean that we are to cease having fellowship with them. We do not acknowledge them as faithful members of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, exercising discipline is not just reading a letter or reading a statement. It's an actual withdrawing of ourselves from someone else, a withdrawing of the association. Because if that's not done then it's just simply not going to have the intended effect. Some religious groups have kind of used the term shunning, and I don't suppose that that's a bad term because this shunning is to show that person that what they've done is step outside the bounds of God's revealed holy will. And because they do that, then the people who are determined to stand fast in God's holy, divine, revealed will can no longer have that joint participation or association or a sharing with them. Because we cease fellowship, we cannot do anything that shows that we still believe that fellowship is okay. Paul brought up an example, and we read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the end of it, about eating a meal. You know, mealtimes have always been the occasion of where we understand that we have this mutual participation with one another. We are friends. We generally don't invite enemies to come and eat at a table. Paul says even with those persons, you're not to eat. It's there to show that there has been a definite change in relationship, and that change must exist until that person has repented. Letting the person who has been withdrawn from or letting the person who has been disciplined still have social interaction with you. And although Paul uses the instance of eating with someone, there's a lot of social interactions that we can have with people. But when we have those social interactions with people that have been withdrawn from and we act like nothing has changed, then that sends the message to them and to the rest of the world that we don't believe that discipline is real, that we don't believe that there's any necessary reason to actually follow the commands of God. And brethren, we just can't simply do that. Divided, we fall. Whether we have legitimate, doctrinal, or moral issues that we just ignore and disregard, or whether we have personal opinions that we push too far to the point of fracturing a congregation, in either one of those instances, we have done incredible damage. Issues in the first century that threatened the existence of churches, that, that threatened the lampstand being among God's people, were handled in such a way so that we can look at it and take from it then examples to guide our relationship with other God's children. Now, over the last couple of years, we've dealt with a few pretty significant divisive issues. And hopefully we've learned that we don't press those issues to the point of dividing. Yes, we all have our different opinions, and those opinions may be opinions that are held innocently. They may have a political motive. They may have a medical motive based on your background and your learning and your training, but it doesn't matter. We don't push these to the point of dividing the body of Jesus Christ. And one of the unfortunate parts is that I've seen so much of the ill will and the bad feelings because of these very things. 
And brethren, it just shouldn't be that way. God gave us instructions, again in two places that had been mentioned previously, Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where we can have these opinions and yet we can still coexist. And the body of Christ needs this so desperately. It needs it desperately over the last couple of years. And I do promise you, it's going to need it desperately as time marches on and we face all new issues. I understand that it's difficult for us to sometimes keep quiet about these personal issues. Just like I understand that sometimes it's difficult to stand up and speak up when it comes to legitimate doctrinal and moral issues where people deviate from the Word of God. But true proper fellowship, not only with God, but with God's people, is worth the cost. We are to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and we need to be doing that. When legitimate issues of right and wrong come up, we can't just ignore them because they won't just go away. When someone has a serious illness in their body, you've got to make sure that that serious illness is dealt with or else it's going to kill you. Every congregation that deals with these serious issues are going to have to understand and live by the processes that God gave. And that's why we spent these several minutes going over 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because fellowship involves us standing for right. We don't want to be divided. We don't want to be divided because of matters of just personal conscience. And we don't want to be divided when we reject standing for God's holy word. The Lord gave us discipline to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. So let's make sure that going forward, that we always live in a way where we on one hand stand for truth. And when people decide that they won't stand for truth, that we are long-suffering and that we try to teach them, that we try to bring them back to the fold of God. But if they refuse to repent, that we exercise discipline as necessary. Then on the other hand, let's so live that if we have personal consciences, if we do have personal opinions, it's not that we shouldn't just have those, but that we in maturity realize that those aren't what God said. Those are just simply my own feelings about this matter or that matter. And I'm not to bind them. I'm not to ridicule someone when they don't hold the same kind of opinion that I hold. I'm not to create division and discord within a local body when, my, when everyone doesn't align with my opinions and my beliefs. It takes maturity, I know. But remember, preserving the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace is worth the cost. I'm so thankful that you've taken time out of your day to watch this video and to think about some of the things that I've had to say. I hope that what I've had to say has been straight from the Scriptures and that you can take those Scriptures and that you can understand how they fit within your life and within your congregation. May God bless you, and have a wonderful day. Love is a choice. Does that come as a surprise to you? It may, because the world is telling you something different. We are being told every day that you can't help who you fall in love with, or that there's such a thing as love at first sight. These fallacies are perpetuated in movies, music, poetry, and prose. In my own life, I waited 10 years to marry my precious wife because I thought love was supposed to feel like it looks on TV. The truth is, love is not a feeling, but an action. And it's an action we choose to take every day. We are commanded to love commanded. Now think about that. If love is something you cannot help but do 
you won't you wouldn't need to be commanded to do it would you i mean we aren't commanded to breathe right you just breathe we aren't commanded to eat if something's automatic we don't need a command we just do it love isn't like that love is something we choose to do